Hi, in this one I'll be showing you how to write a full duplex SPI driver without any hardware abstraction layers. I'll cover the required SPI registers in detail and go over the necessary SPI theory. For completeness, I'll be writing the code from scratch, so any registers I don't delve into deeper would have been described in more detail in my other videos. As an example, I will establish communication with a MPU9250, which will provide some context regarding my configuration choices of the SPI peripheral. For the master and the slave device to transmit data over SPI, four lines are required. The slave or chip select, master out slave in, master in slave out, and the clock line. The master selects the slave device to communicate with using the slave select line. It transmits data over the master out slave in and receives data transmitted by the slave over the master in slave out line. The master generates clock pulses for synchronization over the clock line. Since SPI is a bus, the master can communicate with more than one slave device using this interface. An additional slave select line is required for each slave device connected beyond the first. Here is what a typical transaction over SPI looks like. The master will drive the slave select line of the slave device it wishes to communicate with low. The master and the selected slave will then transmit the data over the master out slave in and the master in slave out lines respectively. The bits transmitted over the two lines are sampled on the clock edges of the clock. The edges the bits are sampled on is determined by the clock polarity and phase. Clock polarity determines the state of the clock line when idle. The clock can either idle low or high, usually defined as 0 or 1. The clock phase determines the clock edge on which the data will start being sampled by the devices. It can either be the first or the second clock edge, usually defined as 0 or 1. The two parameters combined create four variations in which the bits can be sampled. When both clock phase and polarity are 0, the bits start being sampled on the first clock transition. Since the clock polarity is set to 0, the first transition of the clock will be from low to high, therefore the bits will be sampled on the rising edges of the clock. When clock phase is 0 and clock polarity is 1, the bits start being sampled on the first transition like before, but this time the first clock transition will be from high to low, therefore the bits will be sampled on falling edges of the clock. When clock phase is 1 and clock polarity is 0, the bits are sampled on the second clock transition. Since the clock polarity is set to 0, the first clock transition will be the rising edge, therefore the bits will be sampled on the falling edges of the clock. When both clock phase and polarity are set to 1, the bits are sampled on the second clock transition. Since the first clock transition will be the falling edge, the bits will be sampled on the rising edges of the clock. The STM32L432KC has two SPI communication interfaces, SPI1 and SPI3. I'll go with SPI1 and use pins PA1, 11 and 12 and pin PB0 as they can be used as SPI pins for the SPI1 interface. So first and foremost, the peripheral clocks need to be enabled to allow the peripherals to be configured. For that I will use the APB and AHB peripheral clock enable registers. I am going to enable the clocks of IO port A and B since the pins I am making use of reside on those ports. To enable these clocks, I need to set bits 0 and 1 of the AHB2 peripheral clock enable register. To enable the clock of SPI1, I need to set bit 12 of the APB2 peripheral clock enable register. In the project, I write to the AHB2 peripheral clock enable register, setting bits 0 and 1 to enable the clocks of IO ports A and B. I then enable the clock for SPI1 by writing to the APB2 peripheral clock enable register and setting bit 12. With these clocks enabled, I can move on to configuring the peripherals. I start off with configuring the mode of the pins PA1, 11 and 12 and pin PB0 to alternate function. To do this, I write to the GPIO port mode register of port A and B, clearing bits that set the mode of these pins in order to set them to a known state first. I then set bits 3, 23 and 25 in GPIO port mode register of port A and bit 1 in the same register on port B to set the mode of these pins to alternate function. Next, the alternate function that the pins will carry out needs to be set to SPI using the GPIO alternate function registers. From the microcontroller's datasheet, I know that alternate function 5 represents SPI 1, so the pins I am using need to be set to this alternate function.
To do this, I access the lower alternate function register of GPIO port A and clear the bits that set the function of pin 1 in order to set it to a known state first. I then repeat this process in the upper alternate function register of GPIO port A for pins 11 and 12 and the lower alternate function register of GPIO port B for pin 0. I then access the same registers again, setting the alternate function of the pins to SPI1 by setting appropriate bits in the registers. With the pins configured to work in SPI1 mode, let's move on to configuring the actual SPI. For configuring the SPI, only two registers are of concern. These are the SPI control register 1 and 2. Let's take a look at control register number 1 first. Bit 15 sets the bidirectional data mode. It determines whether the SPI will function as full duplex or half duplex. Since I want my SPI driver to be full duplex, I will set this bit to 0. Bit 14 sets the direction of data transfer when the SPI peripheral is set to half duplex mode. The state of this bit is irrelevant if the SPI is in full duplex mode, therefore I don't care about the state of this bit. Bits 13, 12 and 11 configure the cyclic redundancy check for the SPI. This is not essential for the driver so I'll just keep it disabled by setting bit 13 to 0. The state of bit 12 and 11 is irrelevant if the CRC is disabled. Bit 10 determines whether the SPI will be set to either full duplex or receive only mode. I will set this bit to 0 to keep the SPI in full duplex mode. Bit 9 determines how the slave select pin is controlled. There are two ways to manage the slave select pin, through hardware or through software. I will demonstrate how to use the SPI with hardware as well as software slave management. One thing worth mentioning here is that the reference manual refers to the slave select as the NSS pin. Anyway, when this bit is cleared, the slave select is managed by hardware. In this case, there are two possible configurations. The configuration selected depends on the slave select output configuration, which is set using the slave select output enabled bit located in the control register number 2. When the slave select output enabled bit is set, the slave select signal is pulled low as soon as the SPI is enabled and will remain low until the SPI peripheral is disabled. This is okay when only a single slave device is connected to the microcontroller but is not suitable for multi slave configurations. This is because the SPI peripheral has to be disabled for the hardware controlled slave select to be asserted high, which means no communication can go on between the master and other slave devices connected to the bus. Clearing the slave select output enable bit allows the microcontroller's SPI to work with multiple masters on the bus. In this case, the slave select pin of the microcontroller acts as an input to another SPI master. When that master pulls the slave select low, the microcontroller's SPI peripheral is automatically reconfigured to slave mode. I will not be configuring the SPI to work with multiple masters, and therefore will set the slave select output enable bit to 1. Coming back to the slave management bit, when this bit is set, the slave select is managed by software. In other words, the programmer is given control over the slave select pin. What this means is that the configuration of the pin PB0 that was configured specifically to serve as slave select is no longer relevant and the pin can be repurposed for some other function. The programmer can still use the pin as a slave select, but it has to be reconfigured to GPIO output mode. Alternatively, the programmer may choose to use any other pin to select the slave. This mode is therefore suitable for when multiple slave devices are connected to the bus as the programmer needs to only configure additional pins to GPIO output to select the other slave devices to communicate with. Bit 8 sets the state of the internal slave select when software slave management is enabled. This sentence states that the value of this bit is set onto the internal slave select while the IO value of the NSS pin is ignored. It can be confusing at first, but essentially, the SPI is a separate peripheral with its inputs and outputs. These inputs and outputs can be connected to the GPIO peripheral to direct signals from the SPI outputs to the GPIO pins, or direct the signals from the pins to the SPI inputs, which is actually what is done during configuration. In that case, the GPIO pins become an extension of the SPI peripheral. When the software slave management is set, the state of this bit is mapped onto the slave select input while the signals from the GPIO pin, in this case pin PB0, are ignored. This is what that sentence was trying to say. This diagram also shows that when software slave management is set, 
the output from the SPI's NSS pin is inhibited from being mapped onto the GPIO pin, which provides slightly more insight as to why the configuration of pin PB0 to SPI1 alternate function becomes redundant in software slave management mode. Anyway, this bit is only used when working in a multi-master configuration using software slave management. In that case, setting this bit low would set the internal slave select low, which would in turn automatically reconfigure the SPI to slave mode. This becomes important later when I configure the SPI to software slave management, but when using hardware slave management, the state of this bit is irrelevant. Bit 7 determines whether the data is transmitted and received most or least significant bit first by the SPI. Since I want to establish communication with the MPU 9250, the state I set this bit to depends on its operational features. Looking at the datasheet of the chip, I can see that it transmits its data MSB first, therefore I will set bit 7 to 0. Bit 6 is used to enable or disable the SPI peripheral. When set, the SPI is enabled, and it's disabled when this bit is set to 0. This bit should be set at the end of the configuration process as some parts of the SPI peripheral won't configure if the SPI is enabled. Likewise, the SPI should be disabled if the peripheral needs to be reconfigured. Bits 5 to 3 divide down the frequency of the SPI peripheral. My microcontroller runs at 4 MHz, therefore the SPI peripheral runs at 2 MHz by default. The maximum clock frequency that the MPU9250 can handle is 1 MHz. Therefore, I'm going to divide the frequency by an arbitrary value of 64 instead to break down the clock frequency to 62.5 kHz, which is way under the frequency limit of the chip. Bit 2 determines if the microcontroller will be the master or the slave on the bus. I'm going to set this bit to 1 as I want the board to be the master. Bits 1 and 0 set the clock polarity and phase of the SPI respectively. The clock polarity and phase need to be matched between the two communicating devices in order for the two devices to transmit and sample each other's data correctly. Since the MPU9250 samples the data on the rising edges of the clock, both clock polarity and phase of the microcontroller's SPI need to be set to either 0 or 1. I will therefore set both to 1. After setting and clearing the bits, this is what the configuration of this register is going to be. In the project, recapping all the aforementioned bits, in control register 1, I will clear bit 15 as I want full duplex mode, bit 13 since I'm not interested in CRC calculations, bit 10 for full duplex mode, bit 9 to demonstrate SPI with hardware slave management first, bit 7 to transmit data MSB first, and bits 3, 4 and 5 to reset the frequency divider value. I will then set bit 3 and 5 to divide the frequency by a value of 64, bit 2 to set the SPI peripheral to master mode, bit 1 to set clock polarity to 1, and bit 0 to set clock phase to 1. Moving on to control register number 2, bits 14 and 13 affect the operation of the SPI peripheral only when it's being set up to work with direct memory access. In short, DMA allows transactions to happen independently of the CPU, meaning that the processor can perform other work while the transaction is happening. Since I'm not setting up direct memory access for the SPI, the state of these two bits is irrelevant. Bit 12 determines when the RxNe event is triggered. The RxNe event sets the RxNe bit in the SPI status register to notify that the data has been placed in the receive buffer of the SPI. When this bit is set to 0, the event will be generated when there are 16 or more bits in the buffer. When set to 1, the event is generated when there are 8 or more bits in the buffer. The state of this bit depends on the size of data that will be received. I will be receiving 16 bits of data per transfer since the MPU9250 works on 16-bit transactions. I will therefore set this bit to 0 in order for the SPI to generate an RxNe event after 16 or more bits have been received. The format of the transaction itself is important, and I will cover it later on in the video. Bits 11 to 8 determine the size of the transactions that will occur between the master and the slave. The size of the transactions needs to match that of the MPU9250, and since it operates on 16-bit transactions, I will set all 4 bits to 1 to set the size of SPI transfers to 16 bits. Bits 7, 6 and 5 are used to configure the SPI to work with interrupts. Since I'm not setting up the peripheral to work with interrupts, I will set these three to a value of 0. Bit 4 determines the frame format. 
I will use the SPI in Motorola mode, so I will set this bit to zero. Boot 3 allows the SPI to generate a pulse on the slave select line to mark the end of one transaction and the beginning of another when transferring data continuously. I will set this bit to zero as I will only be communicating with the slave device one transaction at a time. Bit 2 is the slave select output enable bit which I have mentioned previously. It enables the slave select output and allows it to be mapped onto the GPIO pin. This bit is only relevant when the SPI peripheral is configured to have the slave select be controlled by hardware. When set, the slave select output is enabled and the state of the slave select will be mapped onto the GPIO pin. When cleared, the slave select output is disabled, allowing the SPI interface to work in a multi-master configuration. I will only use the microcontroller as the master and will be using hardware slave management, so I will set this bit to 1. Bits 1 and 0 are used to enable DMA request generation when the transmit buffer is empty or the receive buffer is not empty. Again, since I am not setting up direct memory access, I will set these bits to 0 to prevent the DMA requests from being generated. After setting and clearing the bits, this is what the configuration of this register is going to be. In the project for controller register 2, I will first clear bit 12 to generate an RX and E event after 16 or more bits have been shifted into the receive buffer. Bits 5, 6 and 7 as I won't be using interrupts with SPI. Bit 4 to set the frame format to Motorola. Bit 3 to not generate a slave select pulse as I won't be doing consecutive transfers and bit 0 and 1 to disable DMA transmit and receive request generation. I will then set bits 8 to 11 to set the size of SPI transfers to 16 bits, and bit 2 to enable the slave select output since the microcontroller will be the only master on the bus. With these bits set, the configuration of the SPI is finished. Currently, the SPI is configured to work using hardware slave management. I will set up SPI to work with software slave management later on in the video. Because the SPI currently uses hardware slave management, I won't be enabling the SPI here. Instead, I will do that in the transfer function that I'm going to write next in order to communicate with the slave device. I'm going to write the transfer function so that it transmits and receives 16 bits at a time. For that, I need to introduce two more registers the status and the data register. The status register contains various bits that indicate what state the SPI peripheral is in. Because my transfer function will send and receive two bytes at a time, I only need two bits in this register, the busy flag bit and the receive buffer not empty bit. The busy flag bit is only set when the SPI is in communication or when data has been loaded into the transmit buffer. When the SPI is finished communicating and the transmit buffer is empty, the busy flag is cleared. The setting and clearing of this bit is handled by hardware, therefore this bit is read-only. I'm going to use this bit to wait until the SPI is not busy before loading the bytes into the transmit buffer and I will also use it to wait until the bytes have been transmitted before I read the receive buffer. The receive buffer not empty bit is set to 0 when the buffer is empty and set to 1 when there is data in the buffer. Remember that what the SPI considers to be a not empty buffer is determined by bit 12 of control register 2 which I have set to 0. This means that the receive buffer not empty bit will be set when two or more bytes have been shifted into the buffer. I will pull this bit until it is set before reading the receive buffer. Like the busy flag bit, this bit is set and cleared by hardware, therefore it is read-only. The data register is a 16-bit register used to write to and read data from the SPI. A write to this register accesses the transmit buffer and a read accesses the receive buffer. In other words, when transmitting data over SPI, write data to be transmitted to this register and read from it to obtain data transmitted by the slave device. I also need to take into account the way in which the MPU9250 transmits data. The datasheet of the chip states that the read and write operations are done in at least 16 clock cycles, where the first byte contains the address of a register to be accessed, including a bit to indicate a read or write access and the second byte contains SPI data. The datasheet only really describes how to perform a write access and is rather cryptic as to how a read is performed and how the MPU9250 itself 
response during the transaction. The read operation follows the same format, the only difference is that the second byte transmitted is a dummy byte and not a data byte. A dummy byte is typically a value of zero and is transmitted to allow the slave device to send data from the requested register back to the master. From the point of view of the master device, the first byte received on the master in slave outline will also be a value of zero as the MPU950 won't have anything to transmit until it receives an address of a register from which data is requested. Therefore, what the SPI master shifts into the receive buffer is a 16-bit value of which the first byte being a value of zero and the second byte being the actual data from the slave device. So in my project, the transfer function will take a byte as a parameter that contains the address and the read-write bit. It will also return a byte of data that will be received from the MPU9250. To initiate a transaction, the slave select line has to be asserted low. Since the SPI is currently configured for the slave select to be managed by hardware, the SPI needs to be enabled for it to assert the slave select low. This is done by setting the SPI enable bit in control register 1. After lowering the slave select, the data to be transmitted needs to be loaded into the transmit buffer. How the data is loaded into the buffer depends on the frame format and the operational characteristics of the SPI. I know that in order to read data from the MPU9250, the address must be transmitted first, followed by the dummy byte. I also know that the SPI peripherals work on 16-bit data frames and transmit and receive data MSB first. Therefore, the address needs to be loaded into the data register as the upper byte of the data frame and the dummy byte as the lower byte of the data frame. To achieve this, I shift the address byte to the left by 8 and typecast it to a 16-bit unsigned integer before writing the data frame into the data register. This way, the address will be placed in the upper byte of the register and transmitted first, followed by the dummy byte, which agrees with the communication format. After loading data for transmission, I pull the busy flag bit and the receive buffer not empty bit until the SPI is not busy transmitting and data has been shifted into the receive buffer. Once the transaction is complete, I will read the data register to extract data from the receive buffer and typecast the data to an unsigned byte. The reason for typecasting is that only the lowest byte read from the buffer holds the actual data transmitted by the MPU9250. This is because the 16-bit data frame sent from the MPU9250 is transmitted MSB first and is also shifted in MSB first by the SPI of the microcontroller as per configuration meaning that the initial empty byte sent is placed in the buffer in the position of the upper byte of the data frame and the actual data is placed in the position of the lower byte of the data frame. After reading the data from the buffer, the SPI is disabled in order to assert the slave select high as no more data will be read from the slave device. Putting it all together in the main function, I have prepared some MPU9250 addresses with the read-write bit already set to indicate a read request and declared a variable to store the received data bytes. I also have a timer set up to introduce a delay between SPI transfers for presentation purposes. I then call the init SPI function which contains all the functions I have written to set up the SPI. Finally, in the while loop, I call the transfer function to extract a byte of data from the slave device and a delay of 50 milliseconds before another transaction is initiated. After uploading the code onto the microcontroller to see if the code works as expected, I took a few screenshots from my scope which show that the microcontroller is successfully communicating with the MPU9250. To test if the microcontroller receives data from the slave, I started a debug session and inspected the RxD variable which stores the received bytes. Continuously looping through the code shows that the data received does change which means that the data is also received successfully. Now moving on to getting the SPI to work with software slave management, the first thing that needs to be done is to reconfigure the mode of the slave select pin. As mentioned earlier in the video, when software slave management bit is set in control register 1, 
The dedicated slave select pin, in this case pin PB0, is freed up and can be used in other applications. I will still use it as the slave select and in order to do that I need to reconfigure it to output mode which will give me control over the state of this pin. To do this, in my set pin mode function I set bit 0 in port mode register of port B instead of bit 1. In the set AF function I remove code used to set the alternate function of pin PB0 as the pin is no longer configured to alternate function. I also need to make slight modifications in the configuration of the SPI, namely the software slave management bit needs to be set along with the internal slave select bit. As explained earlier, in software slave management the state of the internal slave select bit is relevant and needs to be kept high at all times to prevent the SPI from reconfiguring itself to slave mode. So, instead of clearing the software slave management bit, I set it high together with the internal slave select bit. Additionally, the state of the slave select output enable bit in control register 2 becomes irrelevant in software slave management mode and so I will remove the line where this bit is set. The last thing to do in this function is to enable the SPI by setting bit 6 in control register 1. Since the slave select is no longer controlled by hardware, it will not be asserted low after the SPI is enabled. In the transfer function, the state of the slave select is no longer controlled by enabling and disabling the SPI. To control the state of pin PB0, I now have to write to the output data register of port B. So to set the slave select low to initiate the transaction, I set bit 0 low in the output data register of port B. To set the slave select high at the end of the transaction, I set bit 0 to 1 in the same register. The last modification that needs to be made to the code is to initialize the state of the slave select by asserting pin PB0 high to ensure it is high before the SPI is enabled. The reason for this is that it is good practice, especially when working with multiple slave devices. I will do this in the init SPI function just after the call to configure the SPI pins. Again, to see if the code works, I uploaded it onto the microcontroller and inspected the SPI lines with my scope which showed activity on both master out slave in and master in slave out lines which means that the SPI using software slave management also works as expected. Anyway, this is it for this video. If you found it helpful, consider subscribing and leaving a like and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.